let's look at theories of organizations as a whole. We're going to focus on a couple of them, classical organizational theory and systems theory, and we'll look at a few other uh, little ones as we go along. Now, in classical organizational theory, we're basically asking the question, how should work be organized and coordinated? And that's what organizational theory is, is how to organize and coordinate things. How should decisions be made? Now, classical organizational theory, which is about a century old, the ideal form was called bureaucracy. Now, you might be saying, bureaucracy, that's a horrible thing. That means lots of paperwork to fill out and complexities that nobody can follow. Well, actually, bureaucracy, the word, was used to describe an ideal organization, and that was in contrast to how decisions were made typically through favoritism or nepotism. Oh, you're the king's nephew? You get this job. So instead of uh, making decisions based on who knows who, there was bureaucracy, and bureau is a French word for desk, and it's the idea that, or desk or office, is the idea that these people working in offices had a, a set uh, of procedures to follow to make the best decisions to hire people or how to allocate funds or things like that. So it was originally developed to be as fair as possible. So by developing these, these procedures, they developed procedures for making decisions by having everybody do consistent paperwork. It wasn't based on who you were related to. There were clear lines of authority in this part of this organization. This person was in charge. Over there, it was someone else. They couldn't influence each other because of uh, who they know. So there were clear lines of uh, authority rather than based on relationships. And there's an idea of this division of labor that this group's in charge of this accomplishing this this group's in charge of doing this, and somebody over in this group's not going to go over and do uh, what they're supposed to be doing uh, over on the other side. Now, classical organizational theory can best be understood through org charts. You've probably seen org charts like this. These uh, um, uh, red boxes represent individuals, and the blue lines represent who they're in charge of, or who's in charge of them. So here we've got the CEO up at the top, and maybe two vice presidents, and this, this vice president is in charge of all these people, and this vice president is in charge of all of these people. And so we've got what's known as delegation of a authority. The CEO delegates some authority to this person, some to this person, this person delegates some to him, him, and, and him, or her. Um, and there's also division of labor. The people that are down here are doing different things than the people are up here, and this group is doing something different than this group. Um, and another characteristic of work is that we have structure. If we need to add or remove a person, we can do it, and they can fit into the organization through these lines of uh, authority and the division of labor. Another aspect of uh, uh, classical organizational theory that we can see in org charts is what's known as span of control. And this is a, a topic that's always uh, discussed often. In this, this one, most workers, there's only, they're in small groups. There's like two supervi there's one supervisor for every two workers. Um, it, that's called a small span of control. Over here, we've got six uh, workers per supervisor, and uh, on the level above, it's four. And this is a large span of control. And so, um, so that means the, the bottom workers are many layers away from the CEO. Here, the bottom workers are fewer la uh, uh, layers away from the CEO. Here, each of the workers gets less attention from their supervisor because it's spread out among everybody. Here, each worker gets lots of attention from their supervisor because there's only a couple of them for, per supervisor. Now, it, it turns out, as people are getting more and more educated, we're moving towards these large span of control. It's also called the flat organization. 
because as people are getting more educated, they need less direct supervision. With people that aren't educated and might not have great problem-solving skills, something like this would be good, a small span, because there's a supervisor always available to, to help with the, the problems. So you might be thinking, oh yeah, everybody wants a, a large span, a flat organization, because it gives people a lot more freedom. Yet at the same time, it's really hard to get a promotion in these uh, flat organizations. There are just not very many promotions going on. There's only four people that uh, in this organization that they have to go before somebody else can get a promotion, whereas here there's, I don't know, 10 or 15 people that, uh, if any of them leave, some one or more people are going to get a promotion. So even though this seems attractive, a lot of times people don't like the flat organizations because there's... Uh, very little room for uh, 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 promotions. Okay, now this classical organizational theory, it's nice having these boxes and lines, but there's it doesn't take into consideration all kinds of things that we've been studying in organizational behavior, like individual differences, people's personalities, preferences, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, it doesn't take into account for how things evolve, how the processes change, how organizations learn. Um, and it doesn't uh, take the, the psychological processes of individuals into a, a account to, uh, to show how um, it, things might change within the organization. So there's other theories that have uh, developed. And uh, a couple uh, ones that we can look at briefly, there's what was known as human relations theory. That's when they first started uh, adding psychology to uh, um, organizational uh, theory. And that included the idea that individual differences are important, that the way that this person in this position is going to be different than this person in this uh, position. And uh, a classic example is uh, the Theory X and Theory Y view of human nature. Not all supervisors view people the same way. Some, some supervisors think that um, uh, workers are not innately motivated, that they only do things because they're being paid and that you have to keep them doing the right thing or, or punish them. That's the Theory X. Other supervisors believe that their workers are, are very motivated and you just have to keep up the motivation and keep uh, attitudes and relationships good and that'll, that'll uh, especially keep them going. That's called the theory why of human nature. And different managers have different perspectives on who their workers are. It can depend on the manager, it can depend on the worker. That's an example of uh, something from human relations theory or uh, Argerus uh, emphasized the growth perspective. He uh, assumed that all workers wanted to grow and that if managers could capture this uh, desire for growth, um, they could organize the, uh, um, um, the organization in an, uh, the most effective way. Another set of theories concerning organizations are what's known as con contingency theories, and that's the idea that the best structure to use depends on the context and the purpose. Now that, that kind of seem, seems obvious, but Mintzberg spent a lot of effort trying to describe, oh, well, this type of organization should have this structure, this type of organization should have this structure, and so on. And the textbook goes into great details about that, and you might find that uh, quite interesting. Now, the last uh, organizational theory that I want to look at is systems theory. And we've talked about system the systems theories uh, before. But this is the idea that the structure of an organization should be dynamic. Now, by dynamic, I mean changes with time. You start off with people and a mission, a skill set, and needs. You start off with these inputs. Then you make have people work together, you start producing things, and the output, the services, the products that the organization uh, 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 is supposed to be doing eventually exist. Now, in systems theory, this output, when we've actually done the work, that's going to affect the input. It'll affect people's attitude towards what they're doing. They'll learn how to do things better. They'll see what the mistakes were, and they'll want to do things differently. And so once we've gone through the cycle, we start again, but 
things are going to be a little different so we can change the structure of the system. And new people will come and new people will go and things are constantly changing or we'll decide we want a different uh, output. And so systems theory says it's continually in this process of changing, um, the structure is continually changing, uh, based on um, how the, the work is e evolving. And that's a, that's a great way of looking at things. It uh, explains why things are constantly uh, changing. We're always adapting to what's already been done, building on the past, moving uh, forward. Um, we can make this even a little bit more broad by not just looking at the organization itself and what's happening inside the organization. If we uh, look at, um, uh, we can open system theory is that we not, on the left we have this organization and on the right we have this uh, idea that there's this organization in an environment and you have things like uh, government regulations, suppliers, trade agreements and tar tariffs, national culture, customers, industry standards, shareholders. These things all change, and that needs to influence the organization also. And it even gets more complex than this, because here we have just arrows pointing towards the organization. But the organization also changes the customers. Once they have the product, maybe they're going to keep wanting the product, maybe they're going to want a different product, maybe they're no longer going to need a new product. Um, the organization can affect the industry uh, standards. It'll uh, affect the suppliers based on what it um, orders. Large organizations can uh, influence government regulations, and trade agreements, even a uh, national uh, culture. Apple is a good company that's uh, uh, an example of uh, an organization that's influenced uh, a national uh, culture, as well as uh, um, Amazon. Those are that's. Um, huge companies that have had a huge impact on uh, society. So this open system systems theory indicates that things are even more complex and the structure is going to be changing even more often. It's going to even be more dynamic in response to all the things not happening just within the organization, but in response to the things happening outside of the organization.